Right. Yeah, that lecture, by the way, in the uh, end of August is on, um, I think it's the one on labor battles and the, the uh, minus hospital. Yep. So, I think that's last Wednesday in August. And we're, we've got one after that where you'll see me seeing my face again, unfortunately, but we're going to talk about. Uh, Cornish miners in Park City. Cornish, Cornish. How, how many of you have been to Cornwall? I'm not we're talking about. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's definitely worthwhile you know, visiting. If you're uh, interested in mining, it's a great place. But that's not the purpose of the talk tonight. <laughs> the talk tonight is uh, explosive. There's a longer introduction to Mike, but uh, I wanted to read all of it since, since uh, it's worthwhile um, listening to. Um, Dr. Mike Nelson, or Professor Nelson, recently retired. This bit uh, that I have didn't, doesn't say that he recently retired, but he retired um, a few months ago from the, the University of Utah, where he was um, chair of the mining engineering department uh, for from 2008 to 2019. Um, he was previously professor of mining at uh, University of Alaska at Fairbanks. Um, he holds degrees in metallurgical engineering, applied physics, and mining engineering. Mike's worked for Kennecott Copper, Westinghouse, the Consol Consolidation Coal, and Coal Process Equipment, and serves as the director of several mining and exploration companies. He holds nine patents in mining and mineral processing, has given short courses on them, and has authored. 21 books and book chapters, numerous technical papers. I'm proud to have done a technical paper with Mike this recent. He's given short courses in the US, Australia, Ecuador, India, 
an expert witness in the US and Australia. 2019, he was elected a fellow and distinguished member, member of the Society of Mining, Metallurgy and Exploration in recognition for contributions to coal mining, processing and mining, machine automation, mine ventilation, ground control, and safety. I don't see, I don't see uh, uh, extra, uh, explosives. Safety, safety, that's, that's the time. This is one I think we'll find interesting. Um, in 2020, he received the general Patrick Edward Connor Award. We can, we talk about oh. Colonel Patrick Edward Connor for a while, but he, I guess as a result of the his uh, expedition into Idaho, he was from slaughter yeah. of in, slaughter of numerous Indians. He was promoted to, to general. But, uh, anyway, he Mike received the general the general Pat, Patrick Edward Connor Award for service to Utah's mining industry from the Utah Mining Association. And the probably important part of Mike's background is his book. His father and grandfather worked in the Silver King mine. So right. He's got a close association to uh, Park City. Okay, Mike. Oh, wow. Thank you. Well, thanks, Donovan. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I always have fun putting together things like this because history fascinates me in the way we as a species figure out how to do crazy things. <laughs> so uh, we're going to talk in detail about the explosion in the Daily West Mine, July 15th of 1902. But to do that, I just want to step back. And... So engineers like to divide things in unit operations. You know, Some processes, an oil refinery has all these different unit operations that they follow. And it, and the theory is if you understand each unit, you can put them together and they work. So if you go to a mining school or whatever, look in the handbook, they'll tell you that the three unit operations in mining are fragmentation, loading, and hauling. There we go. If you go out in the field, they'll tell you the three are break the rock, pick it up, and take it somewhere. Right? So that's mine. Okay. So uh, there are three ways to break rock. Mechanically, some of you may have had experience with this, uh, maybe not. You can also do it thermally with heat or chemically with explosives. So this is uh, from an Egyptian tomb. These are gold miners in Nubia, there were a lot of gold was mined and they used fire setting and battering rams. They said with their battering rams, they could advance the mine face up to two inches a day. Wow. With their slaves. <laughs> Thermal breakage worked really well. This is a gold mine in uh, uh, Wales. I won't try to pronounce the Welsh name, but uh, when they were working this in the 1970s, they cut through into some old workings that had been left by the Romans. And they wow. found remnants of fires that had been built in there. So, uh, sorry. There. So these are just some illustrations from old books. In fire setting, basically the miners would carry all the wood they could into the mine, stack it up against the rock face, set it on fire, and then leave. And they would wait until they knew the fire burned down, go back in and throw cold water on the rock, and it would break as it contracted. Effective way to break rock. It subjected the miners to some terrible air laden with soot in uh, Falun in Sweden, where they used this method extensively. A good lifetime for an underground miner was 40 years. So uh, fire setting uh, made really stable egg-shaped openings that would you know, stand open for a long time. Sorry, I know there's some in Austria. So uh, the Chinese talk about their four great inventions now, paper making, printing, gunpowder, and compass. They could add a fifth, which is an overwhelming government bureaucracy. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they were good at that too. So here's a, a 10th century written formula for gunpowder. Uh, it was well known in China and it spread pretty quickly to the West. And uh, the Arabs and others used it. And it was mainly used for war, you know, blowing doors off buildings, killing people, and you know, stuff like that. Come on. <laughs> Okay. So um, the explosive that was used is black powder, and this is still available today. Um, it was first used in a mine, I think, in Hungary, which is now Slovakia, and 
by 1689, it was widely used in corn and We talked about it. It's basically 75% uh, potassium nitrate, which is called saltpeter, 15% softwood charcoal, and 10% sulfur. And when you took these ingredients and ground them together real carefully, you could prepare a mix that would detonate with a lot of energy. And if you look at the old gunpowder kits that DuPont's built in Delaware, they built them all with one wall missing. And that empty space was faced toward the river because about once a month they'd have an explosion in the powder mill and it wouldn't knock down the building. So, uh, and black powder is really interesting how it was made. Now, there was a huge shortage of saltpeter at one time, and actually, until the British figured out how to mine sodium nitrate in the Atacama Desert and convert that potassium nitrate, uh, all of Europe was short on saltpeter. So blasting with black powder, we'll go through this quickly. You have to drill the hole, right? You need to get the powder in where it's explosion can do some good. Then you carefully have to scrape out the cuttings. That's the dust that's left behind when you're drilling. You pour in to tamp the powder. Again, a piece of wood usually, you know, so you can ignite it. And then you put the needle in. The needle's made of copper, so it will make a spark. The needle comes all the way out the hole, and then you pack around that with clay carefully pull out the needle and you put the fuse in. Right? And at any time, if you make those sparks, bye -bye, right? so you have to be careful. Then you uh, uh, check the seal again, light the fuse, and I like the 10th step the best. <laughs> You're on my gel, right? Okay. So what did they make fuses out of? Straw, quills, and elderberry twigs were popular. So as okay. near as I can tell, they get lengths of this material that was hollow and probably join it together with tar or some other natural adhesive. Because by the time you're blasting in Cornwall, you could buy a quilt fuse by the fab, you know, it was a product. So that's what they did. How did they make the holes? <coughs> Hammer and chisel, right? So this is uh, from a mine in, in Cornwall. And uh, these fellows are drilling upwards, right? So uh, um, <coughs> the senior guy, is, uh, I forget what he's called, he has a name in Cornish, but he holds the seal and the others swing hammer. And uh, those were nine pound hammers. I've got a 10 pound hammer here. You know, I'm not at all confident that I could swing up and hit the end of that chisel with that. And I wouldn't want to be the man holding the chisel, right? But, but they did it, you know? And so um, that, that's how um, the holes were made. And uh, in other cases, uh, um, you would just have an individual or a group of individuals working with maybe three or four pound hammers and smaller chisels to drill lots of holes. And uh, you know, if you look carefully in some of these pictures, you can see uh, uh, you see some candlestick holders that are stuck up there, and that's the light they work by. The photos were taken; these were taken in about 1910 with magnesium flashlights. So, but, but you get an idea of what the working conditions were like. And I put this one in just because it says so many things. First off, you see, uh, he's not really got a stable work platform, <laughs> right? And uh, uh, he's not wearing a safety harness. <laughs> it goes on and on. You can see where uh, the flash powder is reflected off the rivets in his jeans and off one of the shirt buttons. You can also see that he's holding that cigarette very firmly. <laughs> So he's trying to swing up, and this was a seam in Cornwall, a, a tinted copper seam, and he's actually blasting or drilling up to blast the door. So, um, by the 1860s, uh, drilling was one of the big events on the 4th of July drilling contest. My grandfather always talked about the baseball game and the drilling contest. And uh, uh, there were men that made their living by traveling around and winning these contests. They talked about single jack and double jack drilling. Single jack drilling, one man had drills in a four pound hammer and he would drill into a block of granite for 15 minutes. At the end of the period, they measured the hole and whoever went the deepest won. Double jacking was two men. One man held the chisel and the other one swung the hammer. You had to really trust your body, not to, your buddy, not to miss, right? Um, they'd use a nine pound hammer and they'd have a bunch of drills that would be kept sharp while they were drilling. They could swap them out. Um, a good team could make 85 strokes a minute, okay? with one man swinging and the other rotating the drill. So the drill had kind of a wedge-shaped end on it. You wanted 
hit fresh rock every time. So every 60 seconds, they switch places without missing a stroke. It's kind of like the handoff in the relay race. You know, you had to be able to take the steel and give the hammer at the same time. So it took a lot of practice. And uh, it said uh, some good teams could actually gain, gain a stroke during that handoff. So uh, it was common a good team could make 42 inches in a minute. And uh, the record, I think, still is of 50 to 55 inches. And if you go to Leadville or Virginia City or Butte, they still have contests like this today. Back in the yeah. And you notice here, they've got a water barrel with water running into the holes to flush out there. Okay. And that guy's arms look even like he could handle four pounds. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. So <clears throat> after the rock was blasted, it was time to load it out. Mucking, it was called, right? Now, this again is in Cornwall. That seems to be where they took all the good photos that you see. Basically, mucking was uh, this was picking up the ore, right? With a shovel, right? The ore was heavy. You'll notice in a lot of these photos, the men are working without shirts because it's very hot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There we go. So, we're switching to kind of some more modern pictures now just to give you an idea. On the left, you see a drawing by a man named Buck O'Donnell. He ran a company here in Salt Lake for years called Centennial Development. And for their sales brochures, he would do drawings of the men working in the mines. It's real charming drawings. But there are interesting things to notice here. You see the man who's standing up, right? He's putting a stick of powder in his drill hole. He's got a wooden tamp rod. And he's got his shirt off. His jeans are probably held up by a piece of rope, you know. And he's standing on a powder box. You notice that the rail ends right here, right? And they put the rail up as close as they reasonably can to face. This fellow is slitting each stick of powder. The powder, the dynamite, that it was, was uh, encased in wax paper, and they slid it before it was loaded in the hole, so it'd be sure to get okay. And what else can you see? You can see the shovel, right? You also see they had carbine lamps by this time, which was a big improvement. Um, you didn't have to carry 10 candles underground for your 10 hour shift, and the carbide burned a lot lighter. There's another lamp hanging there. So you see, they've got all these holes have been drilled, and he's loading the top row. You can see the fuses hanging down here. Um, this just shows another scene again in Cornwall where you can see the drillers drilling up on top in the rain. Please let it look better. Sorry? Oh, they slid it with that. Uh, a sharpened nail. Yeah. Good question. So uh, the next step after the blast was to muck it out. And a common phrase among, among miners, they'd say, how is your ship? Ah, round in, round out. You know, that's like another day. We did the same thing. We drilled the round in, we mucked it out. So you can see the muck pile is there. You see the face at the back. And uh, right up on top of the muck pile, they put in, um, Looks like that's a, an air power drill because it has an air hose and a water hose going to it. That drill probably weighed close to 200 pounds. So they put this jack in there. Um, it was a pipe that was threaded on both ends. They could extend it out and then wedge it in place and connect the drill to that. So as soon as um, the driller could get in, he would start drilling the next round, partly because then he didn't have to stand on a powder box to drill. He could be on the muck. And these lucky guys were mucking out. Right. This just shows that uh, uh, kind of messed up. Uh, the mechanism on this drill actually it would it would bang against the rock face and rotate. And the miner had to turn this its head off and slide his threaded handle to keep it advancing. So it took some skill. Oops, where did we go here? So a big change came, and that's reflected in these slides. Uh, there were a lot of changes, but one of the first ones was the safety cues. This was invented by an Englishman who moved to Cornwall. He'd been in the, the textile trade and he was, you know, saw the problems with the fuses they had. He weren't sure how fast they would burn. Sometimes they'd go out. And his friend ran a rope factory and was washing a machine that twisted uh, fibers into rope. It's an interesting process if you've never seen it. He thought, if we put a tube full of black powder in there, make a fuse. And he figured out how to do that, made the machines to do it. And uh, um, 
it was powder that you, you could uh, buy it and tell you this powder will burn at, uh, you know, so much per foot, 30 seconds per foot or whatever. So you knew how long it would be burning. And um, yeah, sold for the same price as, as uh, quills, three pence per fathom. Anybody here know what a fathom is? Six feet, right, okay. So, so, and the miners loved this because that, that took a lot of the mystery out of plastic, did all the holes fire, so on. So, there we go, we'll try that. So this just shows how they would blow the hole nowadays. That shows uh, number two up there on the left. They're priming the bottom stick and they would uh, prime it, stick the cap in down into the, into the dynamite and then tie that in place. And then uh, put the sticks in one after another, put them in carefully, push them in with a open hole and then pack the end with clay or whatever, okay? So, it's really strange. So that doesn't show very well, but uh, it shows well enough. You can see that shows a miner tying off the fuses in modern day. They didn't want to have to light them one at a time, so they bung them into 10 or 15. And uh, so the powder was delivered in powder boxes. I've got one up here that my wife, where did you get that? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So uh, the powder was uh, shipped very carefully. Eventually, it was regulated by the Interstate Commerce Commission. It came in these nice dovetail boxes that uh, you can even see the ICC number there. They tracked all the powder. And uh, <laughs> these boxes were so widely used in the mining camps in 1977. There was an article in the Internet Mining Journal about them and being a nerd, I am the stage of so uh, this fellow says that uh, you can't see it there. We see this is a, a powder box has been fastened to a sled with the baby around the park seat or whatever in the winter. And uh, they were used for all different things. There was an entire garage in Tarillo that was made up of powder boxes filled with sand. They were used to hook shelves. Almost every kitchen in the view had powder boxes that put kitchen cabinets. And there was even an account of a potty seat in Marysville, California, that was made out of a powder box and they had left the red text that said high explosive. <laughs> that seems appropriate. Okay. So, uh, just to let you know, uh, we do things differently now. This is distorted. I'm sorry. But now, for drilling, we have jumbo drills. This one has three masks that can drill three holes at the same time. The locations of the holes are pre programmed in the computer. There's a laser that positions it. You can't see them very well, but the operator sits in the cabin and relaxes. So, and then, you know, similarly, we have machines that load blasting agent into the holes and nice uh, automated loads to load them out. So it's either a very small mine or an unusual usual circumstance where a miner has to use a shovel. So uh, let's go back now to what happened to take a judgment. This uh, was a signal event. Uh, 34 miners were killed out of quite a few, you know, by any standards. And it was written up extensively. Uh, this is the park record for that day. And whips fast, I'm not sure why. But uh, the park, this is just to show you the extent of the coverage in the local press. If you search on the internet, you'll find papers all over the country and the interview will cover this. But, uh, I thought, um, you know, rather than um, go into all the details of exactly what happened, I found in a 1939 number of the park record a letter from the man who'd been working at the mine. And he gives it just the way it's written. It, it, uh, his name was Charles Moore. This was, uh, he was still living in Park City in 1939. So, uh, with your indulgence, I'm just going to read this. <laughs> As I remember, 36 people lost their lives that night, and two more, McLaughlin and Richardson, lost their lives in the mine a day or two later. Mr. Garvin lost his life in the loading station tunnel. Three men in Stokes in the Ontario mine lost their lives. 
Two men lost their lives on the 1,200 foot level of the David West mine where the explosion occurred. Only two men were on the 1,200 foot level, that is, one mucker and a powder monkey who had gone to the 1,200 level to get powder and who carelessly set many, men's, many tons of powder on fire. A few minutes later, some of the powder exploded, maybe half of it. After the powder monkey set the powder on fire, he ran quite a distance. So for this reason and other good reasons, it's a known fact that only a portion of the powder exploded and a good portion of it was burned. I was in the mine that night on night shift. Night shift went on at 7 a.m., got off at 5 p.m. The night shift went on at 7 p.m. and got off at 4 a.m. The explosion was terrific, but if all that powder had exploded, instead of a good part of burning, the explosion would have been not only terrific, but they, as they say in Hollywood, stupendous. The gases engendered by the burning powder, not only particularly the gases, now uh, killed all the men except two men on the 1200 foot level. So it was the gases, not the explosion that killed them. For the great powder magazine with its 15 tons of powder was located. One man named Tony ventured to go down on the 900 foot level and climb down the raises to the 1400 foot level to tell the men to get out of there. As they could not get out any other way because the explosion had wrecked the shaft more or less at the 1200 foot level. Poor Tony, one of the finest fellows who ever lived, went on a useless mission and lost his life. The men on the 1400 level had been dead at least an hour before he started his journey dead. The explosion came rather early in the evening. The heavy gas and deadly gas went down to the 1400 level and killed every man there in quick time except Johansson and four men whom he persuaded to go with him and run for their lives at the first thunder of the explosion. He had been in a similar explosion in years gone by, and he knew that the deadly gas would go to 1,400 in jig time. He and the four men who listened to him climbed the 500 feet of raises. What's the tallest ladder you've ever climbed? 20 feet. I climbed a 104-foot ladder in view. I was exhausted. <laughs> so, but these guys were motivated. <laughs> so, uh, um, Climbed 500 feet of raises to the 900 foot level and 500 or 1,000 more feet to the anchor shaft, which is now known as the Daily Judge Shaft. He could have saved that long climb to the Daily Judge Shaft by coming to the Daily West Shaft on the 900 foot level. 900 foot level of the Daily West Shaft is as safe that night as Park City's Main Street is today. Most of the men working in the mine were on the 900 foot level. Would have been a horrible catastrophe if most of them had been working lower down for the gas. You can readily see that the comparatively few men who were on the 1400 foot level lost their lives. Garvin in the Ontario Tunnel, three men in the Ontario Mine, and he lists a bunch of others. Take nine from 38 and add the five who climbed down, we have 34. Town of Park City had its big excitement between 12:30 and 2:30. I was not in town. But I was told the town went crazy about 1.30 that night. I came home about 3 o'clock, and I met crowds of people going to the mine. The town was at fever heat. What we didn't know didn't hurt us except poor Tony in the block, Richards. Even we at the mine didn't know for some two hours that about 30 men lay dead at the 1,400 level. Even poor brave Tony. Papers were full of the names of phony heroes. And this is interesting because you see, you know, there's always controversy around the event of uh, phony heroes. There were positively no heroes except Mike, Hennessy, and Tony. Even Tony had not the remotest idea there was any danger. Of course, Johansson thought there was danger and played safe, climbed the raises. But Mike Hennessy was a hero, the bravest man I've ever known. He was not a well man. He had miners con. As we call that silicosis. No, the early days of drilling steel drills, they drilled dry, dry, put up a lot of scorpio dust. So, um, had miners con pretty bad, but he would go that night until he fell in his tracks from overwork and a deadly gas. Then he'd order himself carried up to one side, and a few minutes later, he was up and going again. He was a born leader. I hated him <laughs> like poison until that night. But after that night, I admired him as a man and not failure. When Hennessy finally began to suspect something was wrong, come 1400, he got into action as only he could. 
told the engineer to put the cage down to the 1400 level or tear the shaft out by the roots trying. Honestly, I think Hennessy could outcast, outcuss any man who ever lived. <laughs> Good Irishman. Finally, the cage was pounded down to the 1200. Some of the guides on the cage are 12. On the left hand, looking north, was horribly wrecked. One man was taken off the 1200 level dead. We knew it was dead. The powder monkey could not be found. The air seemed okay on the 1200 level. This one man was brought up. This was two hours after the explosion. Then Hennessy said that by the eternal, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, he was going to put that cage all the way down and all the reason why. Finally, the cage went down. Hennessy jumped on and took a look. He picked up Red Driver and the fine young man, the thorough gentleman, whom they called the Big Swede. I've forgotten his name. Then he saw me and yelled at me to come and get on the cage, bound for the 1400. Hennessy was always picking on me and Driver and the Big Swede. I hung back and he roared. Come and get on this cage, you damned coward. <laughs> so they were, the others were cold in death. They'd been dead more than two hours when we went up and reported. News went downtown in a hurry. The excitement in town broke loose. We got a lot of volunteers to go down and help load the men in the mine cars by telling them that the air down there was just as fine and fresh as it was on the surface and so it seemed. We loaded the dead man to in a car. You know what these little mine cars look like, right? And they probably had to pull them over and stack them up in the air. As a general rule, ran the cars to the cage like four and hoisted them. Just as the last car load of dead men came up, for about the last one, John Nemo arrived. And then for the next hour, people from Park City came up in droves. Nemo was the general foreman, superintendent. And driver and I did the most idiotic thing imaginable. We thought by staying on the 1400 level, we had proved the air was as fine as ever. Driver had been looking from the very first for his good friend Johansson. We never found him. He'd gone up the raises. Driver proposed that he and I go down and look for Johansson. I got brave by this time. Driver was some kind of a straw boss. So down we went. This time we went everywhere, right from the clock when Richardson lost their lives a day or two later. We came so close to death, we shook hands with the old man with the side. Only our great strength and lung capacity and perfect condition saved us. We started down that winds where they found the clock from Richardson. The old man with the size tapped driver on the shoulder and first and said, come with me, something like that. He started screaming, oh, it's got me. We've been everywhere except down the winds and we just started down one minute or less before the driver said he never felt better in his life. So that gas from the explosion had to come on and asphyxiate him real quickly. It's a mixture of nitrous and nitric oxide and carbon monoxide. It was dense, so we started for the shaft driver only got a couple of hundred feet and his legs went out from under I went maybe three or four hundred feet and my legs went out from under me however every foot toward the shaft the air improved so I crawled on all fours at hundred feet or so got up and walked out falling down several times on the way till I got within two or three hundred feet of the shaft where the air was fine just as I came around the turn I could see the shaft and the electric lights I saw three men getting off the cage I yelled, they came running. They got a truck, that was the wheels and the train, one of the mine cars. And uh, <clears throat> went in and got driver on it. Five minutes, he got out of the shaft and he was okay. Neither of us ever had a headache or suffered any evil effects from our experience. I went home around 2.30 to three o'clock and that night I was in bed by four. And that day, up the next day at noon, I never felt better in my life. A few days later, I went back to work at the mine and lived happily ever after. <laughs> there are some false ideas that have never been cleared up first the time of the explosion the fact that the men on the 1400 were probably dead within 15 to 30 minutes after it happened Johansson said he felt the gas five minutes after the explosion as he left 1400 level second no persons lost their lives in rescue work except maybe Tony whose last name I can't remember he did start on a rescue mission. He didn't start on a rescue mission because at that time, no one suspicioned that the men on the 1400 level were in danger. Third, there were positively no heroes except Hennessy. So interesting account. I thought, you know, I looked at different accounts and that one seemed personal to me. You know, gave you a feeling, you know, what would it be like? Well, for one thing, did they have candles to keep them lit? Probably not. They're probably feeling a bit long. So 
Uh, there was a nice summary of the accident written in some of you seen the book Treasure Mountain Home by Fraser Buck and Tommy Thompson. They summed it up nicely, and that was reprinted in the park record in 1980, I think. But, uh, you know, and then just to summarize, they said that um, this was the worst mine disaster ever to strike Park City. It brought about safety reforms, but the blast was directly responsible for the state passing laws prohibiting the underground storage of explosives in quantities greater than actually needed for one day. So you couldn't store 15 tons of powder underground. Another interesting thing is that uh, now only a few days after the tragedy, Daily West announced that a settlement would be made with families. Every family that lost a husband, father, or son was given $2,000, plus $500 for each child in the family. That was a significant amount of money. All claims were paid by the following spring, and monuments were placed on each of the graves. The loss was not made up, but the burden was eased. Um, the other interesting thing I found, if you have, might have your indulgence, that in 1962, the Deseret News interviewed Lawrence Berry, and some of you might remember him talked about him. He was eventually the ostler at the Ontario mine, but uh, he uh, gave his reminiscence of what it was like in Park City that night. So I was just past 20. I'd been out to a Saturday night dance. My dad said when he was a kid here, they had a dance every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday night without fail. Because, you know, there are a lot of single men. And he also said that the town <clears throat> cop set up a little building outside the New Park Hotel, a little room. You could go in there and fight. Because <laughs> there are a lot of men who'd rather fight than dance. <laughs> So um, I was just past 20, been out to a dance on my way home as I reached City Hall. A siren mounted there began to blow. A man rushing by yelled, there had been an explosion at the Daily West. The doctor new in town ran to me saying, I'm a doctor, I'll help if I can. We hurried to the livery stable where I worked, hitched up two good saddle horses and rode to the mine about three miles west of town. I think we were the first to arrive at the scene. There were about 200 men in the mine on that ship. So, 200 men, 34 were killed. Um, I was going to say that's not bad, but it is bad. <laughs> it could have been worse. Uh, <clears throat> shaft went down 2,200 feet, but only the men on the 12 and 1,400 foot levels were killed. We brought the dead out. Some of them never knew what struck them. They were still holding their shovels and looked as if they'd just gone to sleep. We laid them out on the piles of mine timbers, went back for more. Four young fellows, about 19 years old, decided they'd go down the mine and help bring out the dead. They'd never been in a mine before. They didn't return alive. And that doesn't match with what Mr. Moore said, right? So you see these different things come out. One of them was the son of our undertaker. <clears throat> we used ore wagons to bring them into town. They were laid out at several of the buildings. The mortuary was too small for them. Several undertakers came from Salt Lake to help. Well, the town went into mourning. Many of the men left youngsters. Their widows wondered how they would care for their children. Families claimed their kin, and every day, Remains of out-of-town boys were sent home on special railroad cars. The townsfolk turned out to see them off on their last journey home. Just about every wagon in town was pressed into service. We only had one curse. Even ordinary milk wagons were used to carry the dead. It was no time for being proud. I worked at the livery table stable, so driving the hearse was drawn by two horses was one of my regular jobs. Eight young lads from Ireland had no one to claim them. So the mining company held one large funeral and buried them in the cemetery north of town. Grave markers were erected side by side. The Devlin brothers were placed together in one grave. The mines were closed for a week while the stunned population, about 7,000 people here, attempted to find a way back to normal, normal life. This was only four years after the town was destroyed by fire. You remember that, 1898. So it was a tough time for everybody. Right? And, fact that, uh, you know, 60 years later, Mr. Barry remembered it so vividly. You can see a list there of, of the men who were killed. It's interesting, you know, I said there were a lot of widows and children, but only seven of those 34 listed as being married. Mm -hmm. The other thing, yes. One more, Michael Crowley was generally married. <laughs> okay. Yeah, see, and again, you know, this is just from the- I know, but I just thought- I mean- I just would do that, I guess I'm not You know, and Buck and Thompson, List five names that don't appear in any of the other lists. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. And there's nobody named Tony. Yeah, and there's well, no Tony. Yeah. But, you know, there are other interesting things. You know, a lot of them were single men, 
And I always had the impression from my dad and my grandpa that the population here was very diverse. You know, that there are people from all over the world that worked here. But if you look at this list, they're mostly English and Irish names, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and there are some, you know, that, that, that might not be. And I looked at his, some of them I just come up. So these are the ones that Buck and Thompson, was, you know, like they call it Steve Barada. And here there's Steve Barrow. So maybe Steve Barada, that could be an Italian. Right. And uh, Charles Niemi, that could be a Swiss name. And sometimes uh, uh, John Berge, who's a powder monkey, his name's spelled with an I. There are a lot of people in Midway who are from the Zurich Canton where all the names are in I. But, you know, this is Midway. Sorry. And then, uh, you know, Deseret News listed somebody named Gigalund, and Vagalund could be a Swiss name. Zweifel could be. So, you know, you say, oh, yeah, 34 people died in this. Let's go over it. So just for your reference, when you say that uh, uh, families were paid two thousand dollars, these were the, the wage rates for the miners at the time it's for an eight or ten hour shift. This is from 1911, but it's probably pretty close. So you see that you know, they made from three fifty to five dollars a day. I thought we had one. No, we had one. I also had one with the price of powder. So let's just think a little bit about this magazine. It's a magazine from uh, in an old mine in the Tonopah district, probably the one in the, in the uh, <clears throat> Daily West looks a lot like that. It's just a little room that's driven off to the side of one of the main shafts and it has a steel door on it, usually with the lock, but not always. Um, this is a powder magazine in Butte. This is from probably about 1920. You see the men have electric cap lamps. You also notice you know, they, they've driven in a chamber off to the side They've left a couple of feet of rock on the floor so the powder won't get wet. Right. And the boxes are just stacked up in there. The powder guy, if he's standing on a stack of three boxes, come down. <laughs> you did look good. Okay. So, um, you know, some of the slides. Let's just talk a little bit about explosion gases. I told you that, uh, you know, <clears throat> normally if you had a pure TNT or whatever, and you burned it with a lot of oxygen, you would just get steam, water, carbon dioxide, and right? But when it explodes or burns quickly, things combine differently, and you get these gases that are dense and sink below levels and also cause asphyxiation or suffocation. Um, just as another estimate, um, um, one cubic meter or one metric ton of explosives produces a thousand cubic meters of gases. I remember it said there were about 15 tons of powder that burned. So, you know, that's many thousand cubic feet of gases that can spread through the night quickly. So, um, this is not a great picture. It's from the scan of the park record. You can see the hearses going down the road. <laughs> Most all the miners were killed by the force of gas. Okay. Just to put it in perspective, um, the NIOSH, the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, uh, has a mining division, and they have tabulated mine fatality, mine disaster statistics since first they were reported in, I think, 1869. So in 1902, uh, there were seven mine disasters. You know, arbitrarily, a disaster is a, an accident that kills five or more. I guess if it kills four, it's not a disaster, except for this one. But uh, you can see here, Park City's on there, the only metal mine, 34 deaths. Then you look at the two above it, at the, the Fraterville, the Tennessee Coal Creek mine, there were 184 people killed and exploded. And Rolling Mill and PA, 112 people. And that's where the real fatalities went through the coal. So <clears throat> about 10% of the deaths in mine disasters in mine went to Park City. It was still catastrophic to the town. So this is an interesting graph. I think it shows that um, the dots are the number of disasters, the red triangle. And you can see in the early part of the century, there were, there were big disasters every year. And the blue line shows the number of people killed there. The two uh, worst disaster was the Monongamine, 1907 in West Virginia, 362 men were killed. And you may have heard of the Schofield mine disaster in one of the quarters. There's some memorial there. 
um, <clears throat> there were about 100, 246 miners died there. They ran out of coffee. They had to bring coffee so they didn't have enough to take care of them. So the other thing that I like to point out, if you look down at the bottom right, now we haven't had a mine disaster since 2007, which is good. And also, even when we do have disasters, uh, there are far fewer people working we have better means of escape. So, so not as many people killed. Of course, we'd like to see a year when nobody dies at work, regardless of where it is. The other reaction to the things like uh, what happened at the Daily Judge was that uh, the government started acting. Sorry. And you can see the chronology here. Um, at any rate, uh, the Bureau of Mines was started in 1910 to do research, and eventually the government authorized the Mine Safety Health Administration to perform inspections, make citations, and so on. Um, also, in about 1911, a lot of mines started forming uh, specially trained mine rescue tra teams. This had been done already in Great Britain and Germany, where there was a lot of coal mining. And the Germans developed a nice uh, full face breathing apparatus with an oxygen tank that people could use to go into uh, places where there'd been an explosion. This is a mine rescue team in Kentucky. You can see those early dragger units kind of had like a diving one. <laughs> this is a modern mine rescue team. You can see there again wearing full face breathing apparatus. They're just a practicing team. This one's in the top of the mine. And uh, <clears throat> these are miners coming. Uh, from the explosion of the Upper Big Branch in uh, Kentucky. That was the last mine disaster in 2007, 2019. So, again, I hope we stay down on the low end of the spectrum. And uh, that concludes my presentation. Happy to answer any questions or hear comments. So, um... The numbers, like that chart you showed with what their names were, and if they were single, what we know, some of them are and then other reports that other names. Like, is there ever, was all just a combination of reports that we never really had a real live tally of the correct people? Uh, I couldn't find one. Yeah. Um, you know, I thought, well, maybe if you went back to the uh, records of the county board or something like that, you know, they, they would have a bit. But in looking at, you know, um, can only read the scans of the park record for so long. <laughs> but, uh, um, you know, I just, in general, you know, well, there are 34 or 36 men died. And, yeah. you know, and most of them were in the Daily West. Some of them were in the Ontario, and there were six whose bodies were never recovered. It, everybody seems to agree on that. Was there a connection between the two mines? Yeah, there was. Because uh, uh, for a number of reasons, but uh, it made ventilation easier. And also, um, they combined to use the drainage tunnels to take the water out of the mines. And so, you know, that could also make um, rescue difficult because at that time, you know, now we have really good mine maps. You know, they're all done on the computer. And, and if a rescue crew goes in, Every time they come to a cross cut or whatever, they radio out to the surface. We know where they are, but you know, these people are going in with candles and just based on what they remembered it was like. Yeah. Talk a little bit about your granddad and your father, what their involvement was and how long they were in the climate. Sure. <laughs> My granddad grew up in Daniel over near Heber. And uh, um, his mother died when she was very young, and his father remarried. Um, they were nominal Mormons, but his father was an alcoholic. And, uh, you know, the ground in Daniel is all full of rocks, so the only thing they could grow was potatoes. And I think uh, my grandfather uh, quit school at age eight and went to keep camp for some sheep herders out in the Strawberry Basin. And he was a nice family. So, um, <clears throat> And he worked, you know, he worked in the coal mine in Kemmer for two days and he was in a cave in and he said, whatever you do, don't go work in a coal mine. Because they put him in the hospital and when the hospital released him, the coal mine expired. 
So he had to somehow, but anyway, I ended up working in coal mines for six years. And, you know, he did a number of different jobs during the depression. He and his brother trapped coyotes for the Bureau of Reclamation. You get 25 cents for two ears and a tail. Not for coyotes. And my dad said, our pickup smells so bad because <laughs> they put coyote scent on all the traps. You know? But eventually um, he came to work <clears throat> in the Silver King, I think just before World War II started. And he was quite old by then. He was not strong, smoked a lot, and he was breathing a lot of stuff. So, so he worked, you might have seen on that wage list, he worked what they call a top car. And those were the men who were on the surface when they bring the ore cars up the shaft to the surface, they wheel them out, dump on the dump the mill, and the guys on top car, they push those one ton cars out and dump and push the workers back. And then when the mines closed here in 1951, he went and worked at the mine, the Lindsay mine in Lark until I think about 1959. My dad <clears throat> was uh, born in Park City. He lived part of the time with his aunt and uncle over in Daniel. And um, then he went to school in Park City. He was on the football team when they won the state championship. He said, we only won because that last game was on our field. And everybody knows you got to be facing the right way on the football field in Park City. You know, that was the old school. But, uh, you know, he, I think he had good memories of Park City. You know, we were, uh, <clears throat> we were looking at pictures there. And by that time, there were people from all over the world, you know. I said, so did you go to school with all these kids? He said, yeah, you know, he's from a different age. He says, I knew the Bohunks and the Wops. And, you know, <laughs> I said, did they call themselves that? Said, well, everybody called, you know, it was a different time. But uh, he said, I said, well, did you get along? He said, we had to. My dad's all worked together. You know, I think that's a common thing in my families. You know, people, are, everybody gets along because they have to. And, uh, <clears throat> He played when he was in high school. He played in a band that was run by Ma Fletcher. Maybe you've heard of her. I think there's a picture of him. And he played the trombone. But uh, he said one night the drummer was so drunk he couldn't sit on the stool. So Ma Fletcher said, "Okay, Tommy, you're playing drums." <laughs> so he played the drums for you know forever after that. And <clears throat> he said he thought when he graduated he would go work in the mines like all the other guys. But for some reason, his mother um, thought it would be good to get an education. And she finished the eighth grade, which was pretty good. You know, when she grew up in Charleston. Um, and <clears throat> so she went and talked to the foreman at Silver King and told him, my son's going to come and work here, but he's going to college in the fall. And the foreman said, okay, we'll make sure. But my dad said, you know, he hired on and he liked it. But... Uh, he didn't think anything about college until it came August 1st and the, the foreman grabbed him in the chain room and said, you apply to college? Yes. He said, you better do it because when college starts, you don't have a job. Mm -hmm. So uh, my dad said he would, he would, the foreman would let him work whenever he came back to Park City. You know, he could come back on Friday and he said, I could usually get three shifts in. On the week. He said, and I'd go back to, he went to BYU. And you know, he said, I'd go back to Provo. I was in the room with a bunch of returned missionaries, and they thought I was going up to Park City to party. <laughs> they didn't know that I looked so bad because I worked, this, but I didn't tell them. They were all going to convert me into a slave. <laughs> but uh, he had a story that this came a lot to me, and I'll probably get choked up when I tell it to you. But forgive me. So when he first went to work in the Silver King, every miner had a partner. They always worked pairs. And he says, My partner was this old Mohawk. I saw him every Saturday night, passed out, and he followed his own mom. He smoked a pipe, and for lunch he had some kind of hard sausage and a roll and two cloves of garlic and some white liquid in a mason jar that he said was water. <laughs> and he said, I got up in the stove with him. A lot of times the stoves were kind of a dead end, so they'd get hot and humid. Sometimes they'd call it the hot box. I got up in there and the smell was so bad I could hardly stand it. I got come and work all summer with this guy. He said, about the third week, we were eating our dinner, sitting on a timber, and all of a sudden, oh, and they called this man Gimme C. Because when he needed a tool, he said, Gimme C the hammer. <laughs> <laughs> Gimme C the axe. He said, 
I was, sit, I was sitting there eating my sandwich, the gimme seat jumped up and just flew across the sofa and knocked me off the timber I was standing on. And I looked up and a rock fell in my place. <laughs> Sorry. So that smelly old thorns. <laughs> um, he went on to become a high school band teacher. And I think, <clears throat> excuse me, his growing up here and those experiences, I mean, he always looked out for the kids that needed some support. You know, you may have had teachers that did that. You saw them do it. You know, I was talking, you know, some years ago to a young man who had been a high school student in Logan, Utah in 18, 1982. And then he was a gay man. And it was hard to be gay in Logan, Utah in 1982. He said, your dad was the only man at Logan High School that was ever asked me. And that's even tricky. And people say, oh, yeah, I grew up rough in a mining camp. I think there were a lot of things we learned in the mining camp. The part of my sentimentality. So he did work, you know, all through college in, in the Silver King. And um, he told the boss that he was going to get married the last summer. And the boss said, <clears throat> You better tell the boys that your last shift was Friday and then work your last shift on Thursday. Mm -hmm. Because in those times, they painted the mine timbers with cream soap to keep them from rotting. And the custom was if the miner was getting married, uh, the men would grab him and paint his snubby regions with cream <laughs> soap. <laughs> Just a joke. Yeah. So he got out of that. But my mom remembers coming here to visit. <clears throat> At that time, you know, people went down the mine as tourists, I guess. So put her in the mine, and uh, <clears throat> she said, I heard that guy run the elevator saying, should we drop her? <laughs> my dad said yes, so there was a way to put the brakes on the hoist and let a lot of loose rope and go over. Oh, and she said, oh, I thought my knees were going to go through the top of my head. Toward, you know, that that would that be that's a foolish thing to do in the real world. That was her experience. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I thought they were also like Chinese people in the mines. They weren't allowed to work in the mines. No, by law. Yeah. That's why there are so many Chinese laundries in that front. If you go up into Montana or Idaho, where there was a lot of plaster mining, where they were just digging up gravel and washing it, you'll find places where you can, the, the Chinese were allowed to rework the tailings piles from the dredges and sluice boxes. And you walk along and you see places where the rocks are all stacked very carefully by size. And, and, and the old guy was up with there said, yeah, that's where the Chinese reworked it. Just, they could get gold and all that else. But, and I think, uh, as I recall, most of the laundries were down along the China Bridge, right? Yeah. Yes. Have you ever uh, ever find out what the actual back London was in Slovenia and send that kind of a the smoke Yeah, well, you know, almost everybody smoked in those yeah. days, you know. Coal miners chewed because we weren't supposed to smoke in coal mine. But uh, <clears throat> you know the the accounts say um, they don't really know what happened. They assume that Bergie went into the powder magazine to get the powder for the ship, and either he dropped his candle or an ash from his cigarette hit it, and then apparently it started to burn because they found pieces of him 100 feet down the drift in the swimming pool. He must have gone some distance before he spoke. But, you know, the other thing was, you know, nowadays, if there's even a single fatality, the Mine Safety and Health Administration will take six months investigating it. And, you know, how could it be prevented? But that didn't happen in the case either. Is it a federal law that possibly wants to store Eventually, but it was individual states that passed it first. Yeah. 
And in Utah was one of the first. Utah was also the first state to require an eight hour work day. Which is interesting because all of them right now are 12 and 12. When was that introduced? When was that? Uh, I think it was maybe 1912 and 1913. And the miners' unions really pushed for that. Because, you know, they, they worked those long hours. And that was time, that didn't count the time they spent when they, when they were working, right? Because that was time in the face. So it was long days. Thank you. Thanks for your question. <laughs> So, 